Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're so happy to have you here today for our Healing Through Design talk. My name is Anna Karnick. I'm an independent curator and writer and the curatorial director for Design Miami 2023. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be joined by our wonderful panelists today, the incredibly talented designers Nefemi Marcus Bello from Nigeria, Victoria Yakusha from Ukraine, and Andile <laughs> Dialvain from South Africa. It's a pleasure, thank you all. The designers have come here today to share their experience and insight on the subject of healing through design. Each of these practices in their own way harnesses design as a tool to resist, correct, and or uplift from reclaiming space and defying divisive forces to honoring heritage and nurturing hope and community, finding inspiration and even material source from their immediate environments, at times the very ground beneath their feet, these creatives use design to transform and empower, creating narrative-driven works that tell very important stories. And in embracing the storytelling power of design, they nurture connections beyond borders. Thank you all so much for being here. So uh, some introductions to start things off. Uh, Nefemi Marcus Bello, to my left, is a Lego space designer known for his community-led, empathy-driven design approach, which centers and celebrates African culture, materials, and making traditions and innovations. He is the recipient of the 2023 Monocle Design Award for Emerging Designer of the Year, the 2022 Hublot LVMH Design Prize winner, and the 2021 Wallpaper Life Enhancer Design Award. His work has been acquired by the Design Museum London, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Denver Art Museum. At Design Miami this year, Nefemi is showing a beautiful curio presentation entitled Tales by Moonlight with Marta Los Angeles, uh, as well as a very special piece uh, that sits beside this year's curatorial statement called Omi Iyo, which means uh, salt water, which is a very poetic reflection on the immigration crisis. He was also just awarded the fair's first ever Curator's Choice Award uh, for his incredible socially minded practice. Thank you for being here, Nefemi. They're all very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Next, we have Victoria Yakusha, a Ukrainian designer, artist, and architect whose unique live design philosophy centers around a deep connection to Earth and Ukrainian cultural heritage. She is the founder of Fena, a design brand specializing in furniture, decor, and lighting, as well as creator of the signature sustainable material, Zatista. Zatista, yeah. okay. <laughs> Uh, and a global ambassador for Ukrainian design. Victoria was named the 2019 L Decoration Ukraine Designer of the Year. In 2022, she won the, the award for Best Curio of the Year at Design Miami Basel. This year, she's presenting The Land of Light, a beautiful new collection as a curio uh, that honors the undimmable spirit of the Ukrainian people and reminds all of us to look within for strength and light. Thank you, Victoria. And last but not certainly, but certainly not least, uh, Andile Dialvain is one of South Africa's foremost ceramic artists and a community healer. Guided by a deep spiritual connection to his ancestors, Dialvain's large scale ceramic works are metaphorical vessels through which he seeks to honor cultural traditions and to share his journey of healing, including helping to heal the multi-generational wounds of his community's forcible displacement from their land in the 1960s. His chosen medium of clay is a life-affirming connection to Mother Earth. His most recent solo show, Ithongo, which translates as ancestral dreamscape, refers to the medium through which ancestors' messages are transmitted. The collection of ceramic seats, one of which is on view with Southern Guild, just steps from here, which you should definitely see, uh, 
It debuted in Dialvane's village in the Eastern Cape and was since exhibited at Southern Guild in Cape Town and Friedman Benda in New York. Dialvane's work is in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Vitra Design Museum, and Perez Museum in Miami, among many others. Um, so welcome, thank you. <laughs> So uh, we're lucky enough today, each of the designers has kindly put together a, a brief presentation to really help frame their practice and specifically through the lens of healing through design. Um, and to kick things off, Nefemi, I'd love to start with you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so I think for me, my practice is actually split into two. I have the um, commercial side and also have the artistic side. I'm a trained industrial designer. Um, my background is actually in consumer electronics. And for a very long time, I had designed mass produced items um, for developing countries, so to speak. Um, but one thing that happened was I, I was trained as an industrial designer in Europe, in England, and when I moved back to Nigeria, a lot of people were saying that I had taken a step back and design in itself didn't exist in West Africa. Contemporary design didn't exist. Um, and I kind of had to look inwards and look around my city and realize that actually the design that was happening was actually from a grassroots level. Um, and a lot of it was anonymously designed objects, so unauthored objects that kind of are in our daily lives and basically enhance our daily lives. Um, and while, while kind of carrying out that investigation and conversations with people around me, I realized that a lot of these products actually, the most common uh, thing about them was the empathy at, at which they were being made um, also, making sure that there was um, consideration not just to the end user, but every single stakeholder involved in the process. So, I think about a year and a half ago, I kind of came up with this Venn diagram, <laughs> which kind of looks very, <laughs> very official now. Um, but basically, making sure that when I designed commercially, that I was considerate, trying to figure out to be considerate to every single stakeholder as well and learning from these anonymously designed objects um, in my city. Um, so, after I think about three years ago, I started asking myself another question. Um, and one of the main questions I was trying to figure out was, why is it that certain materials tend to exist within um, the African continent? Um, and especially within West Africa as well. Um, and I thought to myself, what was the easiest way to kind of answer these questions and carry out research um, and realize very quickly that it was actually easier to carry out research by doing. So I started this design series called Oriki and it basically looks at how and why certain materials still exist or kind of disappearing within my city. This is um, an image of the first uh, piece that I did, which is, was a collaboration with bronze casters in Benin. Um, and the textures that you actually see are the fingerprints of myself and the bronze casters. Um, it was done using lost cast waxing, but actually um, with a silicon mold, which they hadn't used before. So there was actually a lot of knowledge exchange within this process um, and also consideration to their own practice um, while I was designing and um, coming up with this concept. Um, for Act 2, that's currently showing um, at the booth with Marta, I wanted to pose the question around why aluminium started becoming very prominent within my city, especially recycled aluminium. And um, I think about eight years ago now, I bought a secondhand car from America 
and shipped it to Lagos and I wanted to fix it up. But a cousin of um a cousin and I my cousin and I then went to a scrapyard called the Wode Oniri. Um and we were looking to buy secondhand parts for this car. Um when we got there I realized very quickly that this was probably one of the largest um maybe I'd say even manufacturing hubs in in uh, Lagos, which was I would say an unofficial way to kind of put it because it's not really a stamp on to say, okay, if you want to make anything, you should go to a Woody. It's only if you want to get secondhand parts for your car that you should. But I noticed that the sand casting process that they were u make, um, using to kind of recycle the aluminum um, was something that maybe I could kind of investigate and again, understand why this process and this material is quite prominent. Um, and for me, I wanted to um, build with the material and build with the community to create um, objects. So I, I think my time's nearly up, so I'll, I'll speed on very quickly. <laughs> um, so this is what's showing, um, and this is what uh, was actually made. Most of them are made from secondhand um, car parts, aluminum, um, and it was sand casted. It was an amazing process because usually the sand cast, the foundry that I work with actually make small objects. Uh, but I think through various discussions and exchange, I actually learned a lot. Um, and I think they also learned a lot around what design means and how to kind of maybe diversify their portfolio of outputs through design. Um, and I'm hoping to kind of still carry out that conversation with them as well. Um, again, speed on very quickly. This is the entrance piece for this year's uh, theme, Where We Stand. Um, and it's basically speaking on undocumented um, immigrants going from uh, West Africa and making the journey through the Mediterranean um, and trying to find their way into Europe. Um, after an encounter with um, someone in Venice who was an undocumented immigrant and who had told me a horrific story about how he lost his friend throughout the journey and salt water getting into his mouth um, and salt being such a traumatic uh, uh, thing for him to experience now, um, I thought this was an opportunity to kind of tell the story through the element, um, in this case, salt. So the the um, the structure you see at the top actually is an abstract boat that's dropping salt um, throughout the um, Design Miami on the ground to kind of pay homage and bring um, bring attention to this conversation. And of course, the fact that Miami in itself is a migration hub and people have come from Cuba on boats um, and gotten into Miami as well in the past, I thought this was an important um, thing to kind of highlight and discuss. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we can pass it down to Victoria. Hi. Um, my roots and heritage play an important role in my life and my work. Our ancestors uh, love life, singing songs, eating tasty food, decorating uh, their places, uh, despite everything they had their zest for life. Uh, which uh, I find healing, uh, especially in the dark time. I look back to the history of my country and the tradition of my nation and uh, find power and energy in it, and I want uh, to share for, uh, it. Uh, it's uh, our signature collection, Sonyakh. Sonyakh, uh, it's mean in Ukrainian sunflower. Uh, our ancestors did not fight with nature, but lived in a deep connection with it, building their life around the solar circles. And nowadays we try to follow the light as the sunflower follows uh, the sun. This, this collection. It's our unique uh, sustainable uh, materials, Stista. It's a fusion of cellulose, uh, clay, flex fiber, uh, wooden chips. Uh, this is um, our collection, Stepping of Ukrainian Soul, uh, which I show uh, in our Basel last year. 
Uh, one of the most powerful source of light energy for me uh, is my land. Uh, and the soil itself, uh, because it's very powerful. Ukrainian soil is very powerful. So it became an inspiration for the collection Step in Ukrainian Soul, which was presented, uh, of course, is about it. You can see. And uh, this year, I uh, show uh, in uh, Design Miami the collection, limited edition collection, Land of Light. Uh, it's about inner light. Uh, it's, uh, it's a personal one. My home is in the Bucha town, Kiev region. There are total destruction and massacre happened in March 2022. That time I was totally gutted and devastated. After time I felt a need to find hope and light to lead me through this darkness and this is how the collection was born. The land of light is to be a safe place full of spiritual light and core values. I think uh, in this dark time marked by war and conflict we face, we all need to find this light. And I made this collection to be something which, like a lighthouse, can navigate us away from the despair. Все навкруги болить, і наче темрява, і питання, навіщо? І що далі? Але зсередини тихенько мерехтить яскраве світло, як промінь. Наче непомітно, але відчуваєш, як промінь збільшується, і все навколо легше. Силу надає поєднання таких же. Це земля світла. The last word of a short poem, actually it's my poem, in the video, unifying people, this is the land of light, provides the main message that I want people to hear. That if we all try to keep our internal light and unite with the other who also try, we will create a worldwide community, our land of light. The collection consists of four mystical creature, each is a symbol of enlightenment and uh, self-discovery. Uh, Sun it's a uh, sun, uh, sun warming one, it's uh, give you a um, joy. Nebeshi, it's a uh, sky sewing one, he see uh, beyond the cloud and helps to discern, uh, 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 to find your dreams. Dovhu it's a uh, uh, long ear at one, it hear your through thought and helps you to find uh, yourself. And Schwind Konig, it's uh, the quick legged one. It uh, push you, move you if you something afraid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. And now we have a, a presentation of Andele Zerk. Would you like to introduce this? Yes, I will. Uh, Molweni, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andile Kyalvane Nyangyangunga Opumekoboko. That is my home and that is my name. Uh, we have a short film that describes uh, the work that I've done, a body of work called Itongo, which this will describe. So please um, enjoy and hopefully you'll get an insight of why we do what we do. And then at the end, then we can have a conversation, maybe unearth what it is that we're speaking about. Thank you. Whenever I start uh, working in my studio, um, I call on my ancestors. Uh, it's a way of calling their spirit to be amongst 
us or in the space in order for me to get clarity as to what it is that they want me to communicate. They, they come to me in my dreams and I might be sleeping or talking or awake and as long as I'm ready or grounded or present I will be able to receive the messages that they ask of me to communicate. So I've started developing the symbols about six years ago. The symbols are capturing the words, uh, certain practices, uh, certain characters or individuals uh, in language in my community, or perhaps not only my community, but just in the world in general. When they started coming through, as in, in fact, they were, it was an overwhelming experience because I wasn't ready to receive them, but yes, I guess I was prepared to take it to the next level. So that's where then the, the grounding practice is needed so that I can be present and become and be ready. So yes, you can use me. I'm hearing and yes, you gifted me this gift of making and seeing. So I'm answering to that call and, and I'll do whatever that I'm asked to do. And hence, I even go as far as this, this work has to go home. Home is Ngobozan. It's a village in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. That's where I was born and that's where I grew up. <laughs> the purpose of this work, of these messages, is needed there by the community, by, their, by the ancestors themselves, as a way of restoring, as a way of assuring that within the, this generation that there are some of us who are ready to continue where they left off and relieve the trauma that they've gone through. In 1965, this is way before I was born, um, my family and the rest of other families in the community were forcibly removed uh, from their land uh, to the village that we're in now, in Gobozan. I made an offering of one of my uh, sculptures, uh, Umalusi, the shepherd as a way of honouring my ancestors and appeasing their spirit. The old village was on the opposite side of the hill. We carried it up to the old village again. So this really symbolizes that the watcher, which is the Malusi, will be the one who the ancestors may sit on that stool and watch us you know, spiritually and like literally physically.
Wokuke ya vyaka kuhu kandi ni bona up hizo kwenye zalom sisi zungaka nata tawa bon netemba unemini ili apadele kona kwa kaseko yena kuhu sisi lele kuele mi moi. From the village to the gallery, the work is carrying the energy and the essence of my home, of my ancestors, <laughs> the manure and the smoke and the dung that you see and smell and sense is the essence that makes the work. Whatever messages and energies that are carried by each and every symbol that there is in these tools, Please uh, take what you can receive because it's meant for you as well. Uh, experience it. Go where you need to go. You know, uh, traverse around different emotions that come about or evoked by the, the objects themselves. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to do first. Maybe I'll have you guide us as to... Sure. Uh, well, thank you all so much. Um, I mean, while your practices are clearly diverse, uh, one word that consistently comes, or phrase rather, that comes to mind for me in um, studying each of your, your practices is human dignity. Across the board, I, I believe that you uh, demonstrate uh, what design can do uh, in telling these very personally driven uh, but broadly resonant stories. Um, I have a question for, for all of you. Maybe we can go one at a time. Uh, the question is, or I guess it's a two-parter. <laughs> uh, what is the future vision that you're working towards and how can looking to our roots, to heritage, community, the land beneath our feet, inform our way forward? And Dele, would you like to start? Uh, thank you. Um, at, at this moment, I think after I've experienced this surge of energy, of messages from, from the past, um, I sort of realize that I am a community member and I participate and, and, and uh, contributing to this community to elevate and to remember, to, to bring dignity, yes, to who we are as a people having gone through so much through colonization and so on and so on. But while we're mentioning all of these things, it's also because so we can move forward to try to not to forget the past, but to remember what it is that it means to be human or to be part of a greater community, uh, a, a bigger system, so to say. So what we have been working on and striving to do and wish that is to create immersive spaces that will help us all to find ourselves, and find our sense of purpose through all these different senses from sound, from smell, from touching, from just being present and be grounded and see, feel each other and, and, and be aware of what it is that you do through the objects and the materials and the energy of the environment that we ought to create and sometimes we take for granted. So these are the kind of spaces that we're looking into creating. For instance, perhaps it could be here, design Miami next year or it will be my village or it will be at Southern Guild but we're looking for spaces that will be called in to create these immersive environments and why this is important also to be able to 
reflect on who we are or what, where we come from, it's because we are part of this great nature that we are and there's so much lessons that we can learn from. So being Umkhosa and Nguni and African from the village, we grew up understanding how to communicate with land, with animals, with the weather and celebrate that because it gives hints as to what, what to do and what not to do because we all part of that. And that is very important to be able to, whatever that you're contributing must be intentional. That is not going to hurt the greater environment, but it's going to elevate. Come on. Oh, that's beautiful. And Victoria, for you, uh, what is the future vision that you are working towards and how does looking to your roots help inform your path forward? And, and you say all <laughs> what I think, <laughs> thank you. But uh, what I can do or what I can add, it's that um, Future design, it needs to be about values because um, if we think about uh, functionally or about beauty and uh, it's uh, too little for us, uh, we need to, s to use design like a soft power. Uh, it can help you to put in uh, very important questions uh, and we can and we need to to searching different uh, different answer and uh, I think that design can be like a soft power and we need to use it. That's lovely. And Nefemi, <laughs> what is the sort of future vision you're you're working towards in your root your work and how does looking to the immediate environment to heritage to culture inform that? path forward? I think for me, what I'm really trying to do now, at least for the past um, three years, is try to unlearn a lot of the things that I was trained to do. Again, because I went to the school of design, right, and trained in Europe. And coming back to Lagos and realizing that the context is different. Um, and also unlearning things like things where it's like, I, was, I come from the school of Dieter Rams because I was trained to create products that are mass produced, that are heavily industrial, um, that are looking to enter new markets. But I think coming back um, to Lagos, I learned that little things such as like design in itself doesn't have to be unobtrusive, for example, because I grew up with obtrusive design where it's like it's right in your face. Um, I mean, see all the work that you've seen today. It doesn't have to be so um, sterile, if that, sterile, if that makes any sense. So for me, I think that one thing I'm looking to do with the work that's coming out of my studio is try to evoke emotion and also create dialogue. Um, I think very cons also making sure that consideration to the ecosystem as well. So even if I'm trying to design a product and I'm looking at what good design is, am I just designing it in the sense that I'm thinking of just the end user? Or am I considering the overall ecosystem? So the makers, even myself, um, and, and the beneficiaries as well, and even the market that's going into. So it's been a huge change for me again, because from designing mass-produced products to starting to do something that's more batch-produced. And the reason that they are this way as well is because I'm really trying to pose questions and have discussions. I'm not looking to sort of figure out a way to um, make as much, uh, uh, what's it called, noise, to, noise with the product where everybody has to have one in their house. It's more creating a dialogue to say, okay, why do these materials exist? Why do we have to sit the way people are sitting in Europe? Why can't we have our own new typologies and have discussions around different types of materiality? Why do we have to have certain finishes um, within certain materials? For example, with Act 2, knowing fully well that the finishes in itself were extremely raw. Um, and that was because, again, growing up in Lagos, I saw honestly used materials with very little finishes, just allowing the materials to be who them, who, what they are and be honest. 
Um, so those are the kind of thoughts that I'm thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, I wonder, for each of you as well, uh, what brings you joy as a designer? What, uh, in addition to sort of the, the storytelling aspect that is driving you and the investigations that are driving you, what, what actually brings you joy? It's, it's a beautiful question, and I think my practice is very much informed by an expression of gratitude. And when that happens, you can see how it affects the next person, because you're acknowledging that. So that expression of gratitude. So we have a phrase in my language, it says, Kamago. It says, I see you, I am with you, I receive. So I'm acknowledging what is happening right now. So joy for me, inspires gratitude. I'm a... That's beautiful. Um, I think that uh, for me, it's uh, very important uh, to hear our feedback at its uh, full me. Uh, for example, last year in our Basel, near the our carpet, people cried and uh, they feel something. And uh, for me, it's very important that what I uh, think, what I feel, and other people also uh, feel. This year, for example, uh, one of my colleague, uh, she lives in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is a city near the border of Russia. It's bombing every day, it's a terrible story. And then uh, she saw my uh, white uh, uh, mystical creature, she said to me, wow, it's something that's very neat for me because I live in, uh, I, see, I see every day many pain, but I uh, see your creature and I feel something, um, something like joy. Thank you. And it's very important, this feedback, that all I do, uh, it helps. And uh, then people, uh, when people um, feel very deep emotion, it's like a first step to the healing. For me, I, I mean, I love the African saying where it says, like, it takes a village to raise a child, right? And for me, the best thing of, about my practice right now is collaboration. Um, the fact that I'm carrying out these investigations and finding um, craftsmen that I'm sort of collaborating with within my studio, um, having discussions, having knowledge exchange, which I think is extremely important, and also bringing them into the studio. So for example, even the pieces that are being shown were made in the space that I'd mentioned before, Wode Oniri. But a lot of the finishes I actually had to do myself within the studio. So it was interesting to kind of actually bring them in and for us to kind of have discussions and let them see the unfinished work and ask why I wanted it unfinished, so to speak, and why I was going through this process of sanding and grinding where in their own minds, what they do is they bring it out from the sand and it's just dust it off and it's all done. Um, so for me, I think that knowledge exchange and collaboration is, is um, what brings me joy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to open it up to the audience in, in a moment for uh, a few questions. Um, but I, I think before we do that, uh, Andele and his uh, partner in life and work, uh, Umku Chazo, uh, have offered uh, to gift us with a special experience that's an extension of the, the ceremony and ritual of their Cape Town studio. So uh, please join us. Thank you. Um, the, there's something very important uh, about sound and the process of creating and triggering and, uh, and igniting sort of these messages from the past in order for us to be able to realize them. And sound is one of those tools that we have been gifted. 
to be able to ground the space and have us listen also to be present. And this is just to give you a taste, perhaps give you a frequency so that you are able to process what it is that we are trying to uh, share and, uh, and, and with you, Kamagu. Let's go. <laughs> Molweni, uh, I'm Kutazo Jalbane, and I just wanted to add one more thing to what he's saying. Um, in our studio, we have a, a ceremony, ceremony space where people visiting the studio can sit and jam with us. Um, and so we find that in ceremony, traditionally, we have our voices as our primary instrument and we have our hands as we clap and it energizes a vibration that aids uh, transmuting wounds into healed ceremony activations um, or healing ceremon ceremonial activations. And so I am honored also just to appreciate this moment and to share this energy and this vibration with you. Come on. so much that was beautiful and we're, we're, we're honored thank you um, I'd like to open it up to the audience we have time for a few questions uh, feel free to raise your hand and we'll run a microphone to you any questions yeah hello <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very, very beautiful. And actually, um, one question that came to my mind was, uh, is it coming from um, a tribe? What you uh, guys chanting, or it's a pure? Uh, yeah. Right now. So, come up. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it does come from a tribe, but it, right now, 
the, the, the sounds that we're emitting are really driven by this present moment that we've called upon in order for us to be able to share. So before we came here, we had a meditation which helps every other time when we start doing something where you become present and intention the next offering that you're gonna do in order for it, you can emit an, an, an energy that's gonna heal, an energy that's gonna touch people in a positive way. So yes, it's, it, 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 I think all of us, we have such moments in ways that we can be able to chant such sounds or ululate, if you, if you may, but with an intention of evoking these suppressed emotions that stuff like help us to be able to, to, to see each other and find ourselves. Um, obviously, we've known each other a very long time, but it just struck me that I don't didn't know when the aspect of sound and the reverence for the process that we've just witnessed now and that has become so much part of your studio practice. When in the 18 years of your practice did, it, did, did you find this and was there something that really was a calling for you? When was that, that moment that this became so important to you guys? Thank you, Trevin. Um, so I think in my life and my ancestor's life and for the greater community, sound is very, very important to all of us. Because if you think about ourselves in the womb, the mother's heart pumping, we all respond to sound, boom, 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 boom. So in my language or in my culture, we have a drum made out of skin, cow skin to be specific. When that drum emits this vibration, you ought to move, you become evo evoking. But so all of us, we participate by clapping and dancing and shaking and feeling the ground beneath our feet. But that sounds guide us in that way. So I had found myself in these many years of practicing as a child or practicing the actual making uh, that when I put a certain piece of music or sound, it triggers a certain way of moving, a certain direction of the work and the form itself. Fast forward to 2000, when was it the pandemic? I had this vision of me playing this instrument, which we call Isitolo Tolo, and in many other languages, in English translation would be mouth harp or jaws harp, and in my language, it's Tolo Tolo. But I dreamt, again, this is a gift from the ancestors. I literally vivid dream sitting in this beautiful valley overlooking this beautiful clear water, playing with Nkutazo, my wife, which we've been married for 15 years, if not 18, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we were playing, I've, I've listened, I've been drawn to this sound, right? I've heard elders and other practitioners of sound playing, then I've been drawn to this. And I woke up two days, both of us, before we were shut down and went to the music shop looking for this instrument. So 2019, we were starting our day, we were creating this body of work, Itongo. So we will start our day by meditating through the sound as a way again of like really trying to ground ourselves because we had the time, we had the moment in order for us to be able to intention again the day. And then at the end of the day, we will then reflect on the day because the imagery, the working and the energy of how we were doing was taking so much from us, but also because we were vessels that are emitting this. So sound was what helping us to basically breathe or to transverse between these sort of like images. So it started then, and since then we've been collaborating with the great community of healers through sound, of healers through breathing, healers through making and moving and dancing and shaking the body, conversation of being quiet. And that's what makes the work that we do really touch a much greater community because it, it elevates, it acknowledges each one's gift of healing, if you will, or gift of the peoples that we, what, what we are. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Hi, thank you all for the, the wonderful talk. I have a question for uh, Nifemi. You mentioned, I was really struck by what you said about needing to unlearn your sort of Euro-focused design education because it wasn't appropriate for the context you work in. I'm curious, 
do you have thoughts about a model or approach for design education that would be appropriate for this particular kind of labor and material landscape that you work in? So it's funny that you ask. I, I don't, um, but I've, uh, since I've been in Miami, actually, my nights I've spent writing a curriculum for the AA um, who are coming to Lagos um, to carry out some research with me on um, a research project that I'm looking at anonymously designed objects that are contextually driven design uh, products that we kind of see every day in Lagos. Um, and for me, the idea again is to keep posing these questions, not just for, by myself, but figure out a way to, for it to be open source. Because it's not, I don't think it's, I think it falls too much on me to just be the person, you understand, dictating what this should be or what um, this design ideology or language should be. So I actually want to make sure that the, the input and output is as open source as possible. Um, but it's an amazing question because it's something that I've considered or uh, considering. Hello, um, thank you so much for this conversation. It was really fantastic to have all of you on the stage together. And so that's kind of where my question, it's just a curiosity. Um, if you all knew of each other's work before this moment and sort of, if not, then um, after having seen each other's or experienced each other's work, just curious um, how you found it, if it sort of made new questions for you about your own work because I've found it quite resonant um, as to how different aspects of y'all's work really feels um, beautifully sort of together. <laughs> Thank you. It's a difficult question. <laughs> Um, I don't sure that I something changed because uh, all uh, my inspiration in my root and my culture and uh, I want to, to show it and um, um, I like naive art and I like animism and primitivism and uh, I see it's uh, like uh, what I feel and uh, all my shapes all my texture about it I see that uh, I continue to do it. I don't know <laughs> because all all what I want it's uh, like uh, to do object like narrative object tell story by the language of uh, design. So I have many I have many stories. <laughs> so I have many uh, need to do. Uh, I just want to say when I saw Victoria's works the other day. I had to give her a big old hug. And I said, um, is, are, you, are you depicting sort of abstractions from the Jurassic era? And she said, no, these are imaginary creatures. They don't exist. And then I said, and yet they do. And I gave her such a big hug because sometimes language isn't what we're gonna use. Sometimes it's just emotion and sometimes it's frequency and I appreciate the frequency of her light. Come up. So Thank you. In echoing that, I think I, I, I find myself, or at least I've been taught to realize that we are nations and ancient spirit reuniting, right? So I've not seen your work and that's both of you funny enough on, up until now and, but when I met you, when I met the work, there was a familiarity. There was a thing about, I've met you before, and we are meant to be these warriors, light warriors, to walk together in order for us to be able to gain heal and emit this beautiful light that is uplifting. And, and it, it's only a community that we are, that each and every one of us, we have a role that we have to play in building and uplifting each other. It's just that we are scattered in all the different places, but yet connected. And this is who we are. And I'm so honored to work with you and to re-meet you again. Come on. Come on. I think that's why we uh, uh, put all our energy from the earth. Thank you. Ow. Ow. I think for me, I'm, 
more than a designer, I feel like I'm more of a design fanboy because <laughs> I've been hugging so many people, um, just fanning out, to be honest. And when I saw both works, I was like, I was a bit intimidated um, because for me, I think it resonates with some of, even some of the questions that I'm looking to ask as well. Um, so that emotional connection to your work and to person was, has been incredible. So thank you. Thanks. A few minutes, I tell a very short story. Uh, then the start war in Ukraine last year, I live uh, in this moment, I was in Brussels. And then start the world, all, all what I feel in this moment, I need to touch my earth. Yeah. And I, all people go from the Ukraine, I go to Ukraine and I, February, it's very cold. It's like minus 10, like this. And I um, cross the border and stay on the earth. It's all what I need. And now we all very, uh, feel very deep connection. Many people who believe, not believe, but we feel this connection with us. We feel like our anchors will help us because it's like power, all our anchor stores because uh, what now happened it's not first time not taught, uh, not second time and we we feel that we have this um, helping from anchor stores because we need to do it and so all our power in our in our land Sincerely, I wish we could spend another hour or four here with all of you because uh, you really demonstrate the, uh, the potential and the power of what design can do. And uh, I know you inspire me and so many other people sitting in this room today. Um, but I'm being told we have to wrap it up. Sorry. <laughs> but thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And I'm sure these lovely designers would be happy to chat with you more also once we're off the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you.